you are on the screen good evening from india this is the second session lecture of day four of ivw gst 2021 i thank each and every one of you for joining us in such a big numbers and that certainly upping the grace and magnitude of the event and serves as huge source of motivation for me as a container yesterday i had mentioned that ivw gst would feature three sessions from the Global Earthquake Model Foundation. And in the evening session, we had Dr. Kendra Johnson presenting a brilliant talk on the introduction on to probabilistic seismic hazard analysis. Taking the discourse further in this session would be Dr. Siraj V. Sandasekhar along with Dr. Kendra Johnson. The title of the combined lecture is Building a Probabilistic Seismic Hazard Analysis Input Model. So before their session starts, May I request our session chairman, Professor J.R. Kyle, to say a few words. How about Professor J.R. Kyle? Oh, thank you, Shantanu. Thank you so much. Again, warm welcome to the both the speakers, Dr. Kendra and Dr. Shahid Jandashekar. I think we are really waiting for your Wonderful lecture, wonderful presentation. Already we have heard about seismic hazard PSHA from Dr. Kendra. Uh, I think yesterday or so. So we are now going to listen to you for the building PSHA input model. So you all look forward to this beautiful lecture in this beautiful evening. Thank you so much for accepting our humble request. And we look forward to listening to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Uh, as our audience is already familiar with Dr. Kendra Johnson, uh, let me read out a short biota of Dr. Sandra Sekhar. Dr. Sandra Sekhar is currently working as a seismic hazard modeler in GEM Foundation located in Pavia, Italy. Dr. Sandra Sekhar completed her PhD in probabilistic seismic hazard of Southeast India from NIT, NITK. Thereafter, she continued her research career as a postdoctoral fellow at IIT Gandhinagar. She has a background of civil engineering and further specialization in the area of structural engineering. Her area of interest includes structural and soil dynamics, earthquake engineering, and engineering seismology. She has authored several high quality journal articles, book chapters, and conference papers. Let me end it here. The digital space is all yours, Dr. Johnson and Dr. Sandra Sekhar. How about Dr. Johnson? Okay, thank you so much for the introduction. I just want to confirm you can see my screen. Okay. Yes. Um, all right, thank you very much. Uh, so, um, as was introduced, the title of this lecture is uh, Building the PSHA Input Model. And again, this is the second in a series of three lectures by the GEM Foundation. And uh, this one follows nicely uh, the first lecture by uh, building upon a lot of the concepts that were introduced um, in, in lecture one. And uh, we hope that this helps to give you a more complete picture. So I'd like to start by pointing to a number of the tools and packages that the GEM Foundation uh, develops and maintains that are useful um, in this field of building PSHA models. Uh, so um, listed here, I have them categorized by the seismic source characterization uh, versus the ground motion characterization. Uh, and I want to especially draw your attention to uh, the first two listed, the, the hazard modelers toolkit and the model building toolkit, um, as well as the uh, ground motion pr uh, prediction equation strong motion toolkit. Uh, the, the others are a, a bit more advanced, um, but for those of you starting out in uh, hazard modeling, uh, these initial ones uh, you, you may be more uh, interested in. So I'll start by quickly reviewing the main components of a PSHA input model uh, and going into detail on what the, the seismic source characterization um, includes. And uh, I want to clarify that there is no uh, specific individual recipe for building a PSHA input model. And 
so in light of this, what I'll focus on in this presentation is a lot of the different uh, tools, methodologies, approaches, um, and data sets that are brought together and, uh, and used quite frequently by hazard analysts. And so this includes uh, seismic catalogs, preparing and processing them, uh, constraining uh, source occurrence rates, as well as their geometries, and the basics of uh, checking and validating your model, uh, sensitivity analysis and sanity checks. And then for the uh, latter half of the talk, I'll hand it over to Shay Asby, who will cover the ground motion characterization, reviewing what GMPEs are, and then uh, going over some of the methodologies used to select GMPEs, and finishing with a case study from her own research on Northern India, and then some examples of GEMS uh, GMPE uh, SMTK. So uh, revisiting the slide from yesterday, there are three main components of a PSAJ model. And these are the seismic source characterization, the ground motion characterization, and the logic trees. And uh, I'll start out with the seismic source characterization, uh, touching just a little bit on logic trees um, and more specifically on how we choose what will go into a logic tree. So the, the Two first steps in seismic source characterization are identifying the earthquake sources and then characterizing each according to the properties required by the hazard integral. And together, these uh, produce one seismic source model, which considers all of the uh, seismic sources that should impact hazard at the site covered by the model. So the first step in characterizing the sources is to choose the source typology. And yesterday we covered how we can use tectonics data, active faults databases, uh, and earthquake catalogs in order to uh, kind of zoom in on the seismic sources, the areas or the structures where earthquakes are happening. And there are two main source typologies, faults and distributed seismicity. And to choose which source typology we want to use for each source, we can start out uh, by asking a simple question. Um, because we know that a, a fault source is the preferred source type topology, we can ask, do we have sufficient information about the geometry and the earthquake productivity of the fault to construct a fault source? And um, again, this comes from fault traces, from reasonable estimates of the subsurface geometry of the faults, uh, from slip rate or convergence rate data, and from uh, significant earthquake occurrences around that structure. If the answer is yes, then we can build a fault source. If it's no, then we uh, resort to distributed seismicity. So starting out with an example of a fault source geometry, uh, this is a, a shallow crustal fault. And in order to make uh, a, a crustal fault, we need the surface trace coordinate. So that's the red line shown here. Um, this is the surface trace of the fault, so where the fault intersects with the Earth's surface. And if we know the surface trace as well as the fault sense of motion, so that means is it a normal fault? Uh, are the blocks moving away from each other? Or is it a reverse fault, a strike slip fault, or somewhere in between? And the slip rate of the fault. If we know these parameters, we have enough to come up with the other necessary parameters using some rules of thumb, like that normal faults dip at approximately 60 degrees, or that the seismogenic thickness in active uh, shallow crust is around 20 kilometers. And together we can take this information and convert the fault trace into a fault surface. And uh, what, one of the good sources for finding these surface traces is GEMS Global Active Faults uh, Project, which is working to compile data sets of active faults from uh, all over the world using different databases produced by the experts from those areas. And these are particularly being prepared for seismic hazard assessment, uh, while they also have other applications such as in research and education. So, I'm uh, showing a screenshot on the right here of the Global Active Fault Viewer, and I've selected the, uh, the Himalayan um, main th frontal thrust uh, in northern India. And some of the attributes that are included in the Active Faults database for this fault 
are the net slip rate uh, and the slip type. And so together, this gives us enough information to build a fault source. A second uh, example is a subduction interface. And this is an example of a fault that may have uh, more information available, maybe based on uh, how active it's been in the past or um, different, uh, more careful and thorough studies of subduction interfaces given their potential to produce large earthquakes. So in this case, there's uh, often existing subduction zone geometry data available. And uh, for example, this comes from slab 2.0 uh, developed by the USGS. And um, and can be supplemented by uh, cross sections of seismicity data, focal mechanisms, other geophysical data sets through the subduction zone that help to uh, prepare the geometry of the subduction interface. So I'm showing an example here of the workflow that we use at GEM and our subduction module of the model building toolkit. And on the left panel, I'm showing uh, cross sections through a subduction zone um, as, it, as it crawls along Central America and uh, southern, southern Mexico. And then um, highlighting one cross section of, of that subduction zone uh, where you can see the past events that have uh, occurred both on the interface as well as in the subducting slab. The blue line is showing slab 2.0 and by taking the blue line, um, sl the slab of every single one of those cross sections, we're able to stitch them together and create a surface. Uh, the second part in, in this instance is to, um, to define the bottom of the interface where it uh, transitions from an interface, so the locking depth, to, uh, to a subducting slab volume that doesn't uh, become involved in the interface earthquakes. And so uh, one tool for looking at this is to use focal mechanisms. In this figure, the blue mechanisms uh, are indicating normal faulting. So that's occurring more in uh, the lower part of the slab, whereas the red focal mechanisms are indicating reverse faulting. And uh, those are more likely to correspond to interface earthquakes. On the other hand, for distributed seismicity, the most important geometry characteristics uh, to delineate are the area source perimeters, whether this is going to be a standard area source or carried through into a, um, a smooth seismicity source. So again, there's no distinct recipe for coming up with the source perimeters, but there are some shared considerations that are used uh, when delineating the sources. So this includes the source of the deformation, whether it's occurring, for example, in the back arc of a subduction zone or in stable crust far away from plate boundaries, uh, the faulting style that's occurring inside the area. So are these faults or tectonic data? Uh, faults and tectonic data showing uh, reverse mechanisms, normal mechanisms, um, extension or compression. We can use other deformation rate data, so coming from geodesy, maybe GPS data, as well as uh, seismicity occurrence rates. And then um, if your source is going to become an area source, then we also have to look at the spatial distribution of seismicity since it will be considered uniform throughout the uh, entire source. Uh, one of the most common utilities for deline delineating these source perimeters is using GIS programs um, which give you an interactive way to work with all this data. So pointing to some of the primary data types that I've mentioned so far, uh, we have some earthquake catalogs, active fault databases, and geodetic data. And uh, here I'm listing a few of the open source um, uh, compilations of these. And I'm in particular today going to talk about earthquake catalogs. Uh, given their significance in most of the source characterization procedure. So an earthquake catalog, uh, as we introduced yesterday, is a compilation of past events and their main parameters, especially including their location and time. And catalogs can cover different spatial scales, uh, ranging from local uh, catalogs that cover just a small area and uh, some um, isolated seismometer network that's uh, capturing that, uh, that seismicity uh, to global catalogs that are covering the entire earth. 
And they can also cover different time scales, uh, ranging from historic or even prehistoric to instrumental. And going into a little more detail about the time scales, historic catalogs are, um, are including earthquakes that occurred before instrumentation. And so the parameters for these earthquakes are usually defined using macroseismic data or shaking intensity fields. And these are reports that were collected shortly after the earthquakes that are describing what was felt in the region surrounding the earthquake. And using this, scientists will back out the location of the earthquake. On the other hand, instrumental catalogs are including earthquakes recorded by instruments that actually measured the ground motion that occurred during the event. And then using uh, um, waveform analyses, uh, processing these data to uh, invert for the location and the magnitude. So, uh, pictured here is an example of the attributes that are included in a catalog and in this case using the format of the hazard models modelers toolkit and this is just uh, one way of, of uh, compiling these data together. So in addition to the origin time, the location and the rupture information, there are also uh, some fields that indicate um, some of the record information that is useful later on in uh, the hazard analyses. And so uh, here I'm listing the agency that recorded the event, as well as a unique event ID that identifies that, uh, that specific earthquake. So how are catalogs used in PSHA? So we've already seen that the geographic distributions are used to help delineate seismic sources and that each source should correspond to some common characteristics of that seismicity. Uh, this is based on our assumption that earthquakes are going to occur again where they occurred in the past. And they're also useful for deriving the earthquake occurrence rates because we assume that the averages, the average rates of earthquakes that we've seen in the past are going to persist into the future. So how, are, um, how can we go from seismic catalogs to seismic sources? Um, again, these are used in two source typologies, the distributed seismicity, as well as for very productive fault sources. And we start out with some main steps in which we're preparing the catalog to be useful in these cases. And uh, these consist of the, the catalog homogenization, a declustering process, a completeness analysis, and a tectonic classification. And I want to emphasize that uh, the order that I have them listed them in here is not necessarily the best order for the, uh, the application. So um, sometimes these get shuffled around a little bit. For example, um, depending on the complexity of the tectonic region that's covered by the hazard model. So what is catalog homogenization? Uh, this is uh, the process that's necessary to ensure that all the data in your catalog is in the same units. A homogeneous catalog is referring to the magnitude type, um, and most GMPEs are using moment magnitude. And since earthquake data is limited, we need to uh, source all the av available data that we can use, and sometimes this requires merging uh, catalogs that were recorded by different agencies who might use different assumptions and also using different mag magnitude types. So for example, body wave magnitudes, surface wave magnitudes, as opposed to the moment magnitude. So in order to homogenize the catalogs, we start by constructing a database that includes all the available earthquakes, all the available catalogs. And we first identify the earthquakes that are included in multiple catalogs. So duplicates, triplicates that are different records but indicating the same event. The next step is to homogenize the magnitude uh, using a set of relationships that can convert between different measures of magnitude. And then finally to select a preferred magnitude and location for each earthquake using a hierarchical selection. And so uh, in this sense, we want to start by um, uh, first choosing the earthquakes that were natively reported in moment magnitude, and then perhaps giving a little bit of uh, preference to uh, local agencies that are overseeing the region. 
So to demonstrate these empirical relationships, uh, the, the plot on the right is a density plot showing common earthquakes that were recorded in uh, um, two different scales by the ISC and by GCMT. And we want to convert them to both the uh, uh, moment magnitudes as the GM GCMT has recorded them. And the plot here shows, uh, shows that for some of the earthquakes, the, uh, the magnitude reported by the GMCT is larger than the body wave magnitude that's reported by the ISC. And so we use this information to regress um, a, a function that we can use to convert between the two. And that's shown in the green line here. We can do this for all the common pairs of magnitudes until we've uh, converted as many earthquakes as possible into that common scale. So once we have a homogeneous catalog, uh, we can move forward with that for the seismicity analysis. And one of the main steps is declustering, which is removing the non-stationary part, that is the earthquakes that are triggered um, after shocks and for shocks from the homogenized catalog. And then in this process, the earthquakes are categorized into two groups. The first is main shocks, and those are the, uh, the events that we end up keeping, and a second category of foreshocks and aftershocks. And we do this using temporal and spatial windows that compare each earthquake to the closest earthquakes that are larger or smaller than them, um, ultimately finding out which one should be deemed the main shock. And the, the plots at the bottom of the screen here show uh, three different common windowing approaches uh, that are used, and um, each of them being a little more or a little less conservative than the others in terms of what is considered a related event. So showing an example of this, we're looking at central Italy, and on the left is the um, complete catalog for this area. And you'll notice a, a northwest southeast band of seismicity following the Apennine region that includes some of the, the recent earthquakes as well as their aftershocks. And once we've declustered the, the catalog and viewing the, the figure on the right, a lot of those aftershocks uh, have been re removed and we're only keeping the, uh, the main shock earthquakes. The, um, the next step is the completeness analysis. And uh, this is re uh, referring to um, completeness is referring to the time intervals for which a catalog uh, has theoretically um, recorded every single earthquake above some magnitude threshold. And this is a time varying uh, parameter because uh, seismic stations come and go, um, more so they come, and we have, we have more instrumentation and are able to capture smaller and smaller earthquakes with time. And these are necessary for deriving robust occurrence rates, uh, since without them, we may reduce or, um, or increase the, the rates that we're predicting. So on the right side of the screen is um, an example of a, of a time magnitude density plot. And we can see that following 1964, when the Global Seismic Network was established, we start to uh, encounter more and more small magnitude earthquakes. And that continues to increase all the way through the duration of this plot. There are a number of approaches for determining how complete a catalog is. There are some statistic analyses, uh, like the one shown here on the, on the right side of the screen by step. And this is a, an approach that identifies the completeness magnitude uh, by finding when the observed rate of earthquakes above the completeness magnitude begins to deviate from the expected rate. So iterating through what is assumed to be the completeness magnitude until it's found. There's, there's also some approaches that analyze the spatial distribution of stations that are monitoring the area of interest and finding what theoretically should be the completeness magnitude. And finally, there are manual assignments that use uh, time magnitude density plots like we showed in the, in the former slide. In some instances, it's important to classify your catalog based on the tectonic regions that are included in the model. And in doing so, you create subcatalogs uh, that correspond to those tectonic region types. So the approaches available to do this are 
um, taking each earthquake and classifying it basing, based on the proximity of its hypercenter to certain reference surfaces and volumes that are representative of the tectonic categories that are included in the model. And so, for example, these are subduction interfaces, such as the one uh, prepared in the initial step, uh, subducting slabs, the moho depth, uh, volcanoes and other bodies. And this is the schematic that we use uh, in the in the model building toolkit, um, showing that the um, the different surfaces are laid out with uh, volumes around them, and those are used in order to group the earthquakes into specific categories. There are uh, other similar approaches to this, and they're all um, based on similar premises of um, of, of hierarchies that make an earthquake more or less likely to occur on an interface, the intraslab, the crustal body, or somewhere else uh, based, on, um, based on their proximity to those surfaces. So to summarize the catalog processing steps, uh, we've produced a homogeneous catalog, declustered it to isolate only the main shocks. We've performed completeness analysis and divided the subcatalogs into tectonic uh, categories. And the final product is a homogenized set of subcatalogs of main shocks for each tectonic region. So uh, next we'll look at how we can strain uh, source occurrence rates. And uh, to remind you, a magnitude frequency distribution is indicating the rates of earthquakes in each incremental magnitude bin. And these are the three types of, uh, of MFDs that we looked at yesterday. The, the first means of constraining occurrence rates uh, or MFDs is by using catalog observations uh, to, to fit um, a magnitude frequency distribution that's representative of uh, one of the, the main formats. So the example shown here is using a maximum likelihood estimator to, uh, to find the Gutenberg-Richter MFD. And it's incorporating the time variation in the completeness to ensure that all of the rates are as representative as possible of, um, of the source. Uh, the um, the uh, curve is fit to the incremental magnitudes, and so those are the ones shown in the blue line here. And there is more weight given to uh, the magnitude bins that have more earthquakes available to constrain the rates. These are considered more robust rates. So providing an example that gets us from the catalog to the MFD, uh, this is a little snippet of code um, written using the, using the Hazard Modelers Toolkit. And it takes a completeness table, um, a defined uh, uh, algorithm for computing the MFD, and the catalog declustered and clipped to an area source. And, um, and it runs it through the code and it produces a magnitude frequency distribution that can be assigned to the source. The second method for constraining MFDs is to use seismic moment budgeting and balancing. And in this methodology, we first compute a moment rate, a total moment rate, that is available from the source. And usually this moment rate is based on uh, parameters including the rigidity of the crustal blocks on either side of the fault, the area of the surface uh, that's con in contact from the fault, the slip rate across the fault, and a coupling coefficient that indicates how much of the, seismic of the slip rate is being released by seismicity as opposed to aseismic processes. Then this total moment rate is divided across the moment or across the magnitude bins uh, by using um, an, an integral that effectively sums the number of earthquakes occurring at each magnitude uh, and multiplying that by the uh, total moment that uh, is equivalent to that moment magnitude. So the example on the right is showing uh, this for a characteristic Gaussian uh, magnitude frequency distribution, uh, for example, for a fault source. So in each of these magnitude, uh, magnitude frequency distributions, there's an important parameter, 
which is the maximum magnitude that we assign to the source. There are a number of different approximation methods for maximum magnitude that range from using the catalog to uh, taking a look at the geological features that are actually producing the earthquakes to finding analogs in other similar tectonic environments. I'll go through a few of these here. The first two are, uh, are from observed seismicity. And on the left, we have an MFD uh, that ends with an M max observed in the catalog and then has a delta value, uh, maybe 0 0.3, 0 0.5, added to the maximum observed earthquake in the catalog. Uh, the second method is the cumulative moment method, and this approach uh, sums the total moment that has been released during the recording period and then determines the size of the earthquake that would occur if all of those earthquakes were released as only one earthquake. The final method is a um, computed from fault geometry or uh, the structures upon which the earthquakes are assumed to happen. And this is done using magnitude scaling relationships that are empirical equations uh, based on dimensions of the faults and using those to compute the magnitude that should occur if the full fault is to rupture at once. These have been trained by observations of past earthquakes that have been studied in detail. So the way that the magnitude frequency distribution is applied to a source can occur in um, a few different ways. And I'll summarize them into two main types of distributed seismicity. We introduced these yesterday. The first is the area source. And within the polygon that delimits the area source, we assume that the occurrences are uniform across the entire region. The second is smooth gridded seismicity in which the occurrence rates are varying based on the location of past earthquakes. So the method for doing this is to first convert the area source into a regular grid of point sources. Then for every earthquake observed in the catalog that occurs within the region of those point sources, a 2D kernel, usually a Gaussian, is used to redistribute those earthquakes. Then the impact of all the earthquakes is combined, and the result is a grid of weights that can be used to scale the moment up and down depending on where the earthquakes have occurred. So points that are closer to many past earthquakes are more likely uh, to host ruptures than points far away. The hypocentral and nodal plane distributions uh, can be assigned using observations as well. And recall that these, uh, these parameters, the hypocentral depth and the nodal plane, may include aleatory uncertainties. And so this is irreducible variability that's intrinsically related to the earthquake process. And it means that we don't want to uh, condense that into a single estimate because we actually expect there to be multiple depths at which earthquakes occurring, multiple focal mechanisms. And the example here I'm showing is uh, of hypocentral depths and how this can be represented by a probability mass function. So on the left, again, we've taken all the earthquakes inside one area source perimeter and we've uh, created a histogram of the depth uh, that's uh, being represented by a probability mass function. Then that histogram is taken and uh, converted into a set of probabilities and depth values. And in, in some calculation engines, this can actually be done using a continuous distrib distribution, but the example I'm showing here is a discrete one. So the, the same uh, practice can be applied to focal mechanisms, for example, from the global centroid moment tensor uh, catalog. And a few representative mechanisms can be used to, uh, to represent the whole data set. Um, we'll go into sensitivity analysis uh, in a moment here, and this will um, 
this applies back to the aleatory uncertainty too. Uh, we, we must be careful about how many different incremental depths we're including, how many different focal mechanisms we're including, because the more that we add, the more complex of a calculation uh, we're setting ourselves up for later. And in some cases, these calculations can become too big to run within reason. So uh, moving on to the sensitivity analysis. Um, as a review, we are using logic trees in PSHA to represent epistemic uncertainties. And these are the uncertainties that result from limited knowledge about a process, either the physics and mechanics of the process or because we don't have enough data. And each logic tree branch, uh, each end branch is representing a single realization and adding any single uncertainty increases the size of that logic tree. So sensitivity analyses are used to avoid creating unreasonably large logic trees. An alternative hypothesis is given higher priority in a logic tree or more likely to be included in the logic tree if it actually impacts the hazard results. So the first example I'll show here is of maximum magnitude. And I'm showing uh, three sources, the MFDs for three sources. Uh, the first source in red is the original MFD. The second in green is uh, produced by increasing M max, but not preserving the moment. So that means an MFD created from a catalog. The third is increased M max from source one, but preserving the moment, for example, as you would do if uh, calculating the MFD from a slip rate. Then these have been carried through into a hazard calculation, and we can compare source one and source two, as well as source one and source three, to see whether the impact on hazard is significant enough that we should include those alternative hypotheses in the logic tree. In this simple example, the hazard curves change significantly for, um, for each of the three hypotheses, but this is not always the case for Nmax, and it depends a lot on the productivity of the source. A second example is the impact of the focal mechanism. So the plot here is showing two focal mechanisms for three different earthquake productivities evaluated for one GMPE. And in blue, I was plotted the result from one, uh, one mechanism. In red, the result from the other. And we can see that for the lowest productivity source plotted on the bottom, the difference is hard to see. But as we increase the productivity of the source, uh, the impact of the focal mechanism becomes more significant. So finally, once you've built a, a seismic source characterization, the final step is to perform sanity checks and data model comparisons that uh, help you determine that your model is defensible. And these are in particular ensuring that the seismic source model is supported by the data used to derive it. So for example, does M max exceed the largest observed earthquake, including uh, prehistoric earthquakes? And is the model capable of reproducing the observations? So I'm showing an example on the right here, uh, taken from the Dominican Republic model shown yesterday. And in blue, I'm uh, plotting the stochastic event set, which is a, a long um, set, 10,000 years of possible ruptures that could occur using my source model. Uh, this was produced using the OpenQuake engine. And then I'm comparing that to the catalog observations in orange. And so we can see that for this model, the stochastic event sets uh, is producing close or more earthquakes than for each magnitude bin. And so we consider this defensible. Additionally, the M max of the stochastic event set is higher than that of the catalog. So uh, summarizing the seismic source characterization, the topics covered um, today included choosing the source typology, defining the fault source geometries in, uh, in source perimeters, how to process catalogs and how to use them in PSHA, how to constrain source occurrence rates, then introduction to sensitivity analyses, sanity checks, and data model comparisons. And with that, I'll turn it over to Shrey Asby, who will go through the ground motion characterization. Can I start sharing? 
Yes, you may. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Is it visible? Yeah. Yes, I can see it. Yeah. And it's in full screen. Thanks. Oh. Yeah, just a second. Yeah, okay. Um, oh, thanks, Kendra. Uh, so I will be starting with uh, some of the components. Uh, of, I'll be just continuing what uh, Kendra has just stopped. So we will be talking more about uh, ground motion characterization. Uh, so until now, we try to understand about the seismic source. So now we will be uh, talking about the propagation and how uh, we can predict a ground motion shaking intensity at any given site of interest. And then I will conclude by uh, showing the logic tree. So uh, this is just a recap for those who are very new to ground motion modeling. Uh, the equation that you see here in the beginning of uh, log of y. So this is a basic skeleton of a GMP. So there are different components that goes in the ground motion modeling. So it can be source characteristics, path characteristics, and the site characteristics. And so this, these three components constitutes as a median or a mean prediction. And that, that is always associated with some sort of standard deviation. So uh, speaking of how exactly these GMPs are derived, if, if you're talking about an empirical GMP, we always use time history record of a number of earthquakes. And if, if you're trying to derive a GMP in the response spectrum domain, then we always try to generate the response spectra. And then uh, there is a multi-stage reg regression process that goes in and then a model is developed. Or if we are trying to do it in the Fourier domain, then we use the same time history, but then the Fourier spectra is generated. And then again, the same regression process is carried out. So here, uh, uh, in, in the source component, we have magnitude, focal mechanism, and uh, distance in some cases. So these are all the explanatory variables. Similarly, for a site component, the VS30 or the depth, the one kilometer seismogenic uh, depth is what we call that. So these are other parameters which are called as uh, defined variables. So similarly, uh, uh, in addition, uh, the same thing happens in the path component as well, where you have magnitude as well as the distance. And speaking of the Y, this is just an intensity measure, which can be PGA or PSA at 5% damping or PGV, depending upon the application of the model. So whenever we are trying to uh, fit a model that defines a set of observations, that is nothing but the time history, so there will always be some sort of disagreement or a mismatch between the actual observation and what a GMP is capable of predicting. So the difference between what is observed and what is being predicted by the GMP is what we call it as a residual. So uh, these uh, the, this residual can be further normalized, as you can see here in the bottom equation. So we just take the observed value. So here, high stands for an event and J stands for a particular site or a station. So this is the uh, observation. The, sorry, the one on the left is observation and the one on the right is what we predict from the GMP. So M and R and theta are the other explanatory variables and then it is divided by the total residual. So the reason why I'm stressing so much about the definition of uh, total residual and normalized residual is something we will get to know in the later slides. So this is about the overall thing. And so uh, what are these explanatory variables and why they are being considered is that in order to capture the ground shaking at a particular site of interest, we need to know what are the factors that are influencing this shaking. So a magnitude 5 and a magnitude 8 earthquake hits differently at any given site, as well as even the, sometimes even the distance plays a major role. So as the magnitude increases, we always see the ground motion levels increase and as the site source distance increases, maybe the ground shaking intensity is reduced. And also another observation is the soil sites tend to amplify uh, as compared to the rock sites. 
so these are some of the factors which are very crucial and will be usually helpful for a modeler in trying to define the ground motion shaking intensity at a, in a more rational way so there are further additional factors such as directivity focal mechanism and whether the site is on the hanging wall side or uh, things like that so this is how a typical um, estimation or a response spectrum from a gmp would look like so the red line uh, represents the median estimation and the black uh, dashed lines represent the plus or minus standard deviation so previously so this prediction is particularly for uh, magnitude 5.5 and a uh, rupture distance of 15 km and ps3 of uh, 450 meter per second for reverse faulting mechanism so similarly uh, so whenever we come for a selection of gmps so initially uh, we, we have this huge set of gmps that are available today um, and thanks to the improvement of the ground motion uh, recording network so some of the initial criteria or the preliminary screening criteria that we use while selecting a gmp for a certain hazard studies have been uh, mentioned in some of the very famous articles uh, by cotton and as well as by boomer and many others uh, related articles as well so but these two are very prominent and they actually give you the list of criteria that every hazard modeler needs to go through for for a preliminary selection of the gmps so the first major concern is the tectonic region type so you cannot use a gmp which is developed for a subduction slag in a stable continental region so the uh, it should always be compatible the target region where you want to uh, study the hazard and the host region for which the gmp has been developed and the next uh, second thing is uh, relevant ground motion parameters like i was saying Uh, the choice of gmp also depends upon what kind of an engineering parameter that you're trying to understand whether it is pga or is it significant duration or uh, is it areas intensity so then nowadays we have uh, fourier models and we have models for areas intensity and many such other parameters so also uh, the kind of parameter that we want to study also plays a major role and apart from that uh, next comes the geographic coverage so there are studies Uh, which have shown that the central and eastern uh, north america is kind of tectonically compatible with the uh, stable continental region of india so there have been studies which have uh, suggested that so usually uh, it is a common practice in uh, hazard studies in india to use the gmps which have been developed uh, in the ng east so uh, the uh, this is also another criteria that needs to be taken care of and if at all if there are gmps that have been developed for a, for the region itself then higher priority is always given to uh, the region specific gmps and also uh, some, uh, uh, every gmp comes with an applicable magnitude range distance range and vs30 uh, range and so on so uh, we cannot uh, or uh, we shouldn't usually try to extrapolate the applicability range for example if the applicable range of a gmp is between 5 to 8 uh, so going for an extrapolation that is trying to predict an event of magnitude 4 or 3 may not uh, give us uh, reasonable results so that is why we should always keep in mind whenever we are choosing a gmp about the applicable uh, uh, ranges of the explanatory variables so this is the initial selection criteria and the next is about the testing of the gmps so after having selected a set of gmps then we go for further testing of them and uh, try to check whether uh, these gmps are able to actually capture uh, the tectonic characteristics of the region so first is a visualization of gmp scaling which we do it through trelli plots and then we have quantitative tests such as residual analysis and single station analysis and then we have statistical tests so uh, uh, all these uh, tests have are supported by our open quake strong motion toolkit so i will be talking about this more in detail and uh, but anybody who is interested this is the github link for that and anybody else can download and it's an open source software so anybody can make use of it so first coming to visualization of gmp scaling uh, whenever we talk about testing of gmps or trying to understand the applicability of a gmp for your study region the first step will always be to make sure if sufficient data is available so when i'm when i say about data what i actually mean is that do we have recordings 
whether it is in terms of time history or we have some of the macro seismic observations of the events that the region uh, as witnessed in particular so it, you availability of such data would be very helpful especially if you're going for such elaborate um, uh, selection and also testing criteria of so we're talking about uh, trellis plots uh, what exactly we will always try to understand from this is that uh, if the the scaling of these gmps uh, with respect to different explanatory variables so the one what you're seeing here is for with respect to magnitude and the one on the right is with respect to the joiner bore distance so whenever we are trying to construct these trellis plots there is always a major obstacle that we face that is the distance metric because not all gmps use the same distance metric because some of them they use the distance uh, closest distance structure but some of them they use joiner bore distance so even these things have to be kept in mind and there is always a workaround solution to this which i will explain it a little later uh, so that was about the trellis plots wherein it's more of a qualitative analysis uh, which, which you can just do a visual inspection but there is nothing quantitatively that you can actually derive from that so next coming to the residual analysis part so here, as you can see, uh, most of the time, the total residual that what we get, that is the difference between the observation and the prediction from the GMP, that is usually considered as a normally distributed uh, residual with a mean of zero and standard deviation of sigma. So whenever we do this normalized residual and this is being plotted, one will be the uh, uh, distribution probability density function of the GMP and the other one is the probability density function of our own observations so if in this case uh, the mean value is greater than zero uh, which means that the gmp is kind of underestimating the observation so the black line is what you see here is our observation and the gray line is what you're seeing as a gmp so again like i told uh, we try to understand whether the gmp is actually uh, overestimating or underestimating. So that is one important thing uh, when, whenever we look into residual analysis. And apart from that, whenever we uh, are talking or we just talk about purely uh, residual analysis, as you can see here in the left, we just know whether the model is over predicting or under predicting. So there is no more further revelations from this type of texts. So that is to understand systematically, understand how well the GMP performs with respect to some of the explanatory or predictor variables. We actually plot these residuals in terms of the uh, explanatory variables such as magnitude, distance, and site, and also uh, hypocentral depth. Uh, the reason uh, behind doing this is if, if at all, if the GMP is not performing well with respect to the distance attenuation, then we we would know which type of other GMP that we can test, or we would at least know where exactly this particular GMP is failing to capture the actual phenomena. So that is the reason we actually test this uh, as per the different uh, explanatory variables. So coming to the uh, statistical tests, the one of them is the log likelihood method. Uh, the reason why uh, the, this model, uh, sorry, this method was actually earlier developed in 2004, which has been later developed again and I mean, modified in 2009. And nowadays there are more complex and more advanced uh, tests that are available, which we, they call it as multivariate uh, log likelihood methods as well. So, but uh, the basic concept behind a log likelihood method is that if I consider the probability density uh, function of a GMPE to be G of X or something, then I would like to know what is the likelihood of the model to be predicting an observation, which is nothing but the XI. So again, XI is just uh, an observation for an event I, and it is uh, uh, summed up over the, an entire range of events that we have. So after that, uh, we always take the log function of the, that is where the name comes, uh, the log likelihood. Uh, another interesting uh, concept which was proposed by Sherbum in his article was something called as cool back labeler distance. So what exactly this uh, D value is trying to propose is the distance between an actual prediction and the actual ground motion. So here F of X is what we call it as an earthquake phenomena. Uh, we, we don't know the function, but we have some limited number of samples, which is what we call it as observation. And then we know uh, the uh, probability density function of the GMP for the same set of observations. So then we try to find the distance. In addition to uh, such interesting uh, 
functions, he also proposed a formula to calculate the weight uh, for each of the GMP. So using the formula, which is in the last, we can actually always find out what should be uh, the weight assigned to a given GMP. Uh, so these weights particularly come handy uh, when you are trying to use a logic tree approach. Another uh, uh, statistical test that has been proposed recently is the Euclidean distance-based ranking. So there's a lot of uh, equations and I will not go in detail, but I'll just explain the overall takeaway points from this. So here again, D stands for distance, and this is the difference between the observation and the uh, model estimate. So the main uh, functions that come are inside this green uh, box. So basically, uh, when we talk about the modified Euclidean distance, that is MDA, we are trying to see uh, what is the median estimate or the difference between the observation and the prediction. So, and again, kappa here, this actually takes care of the model estimate bias. So these two are kind of combined together and then uh, it, uh, uh, Euclidean distance ranking is given for the set of GMPs that is being tested. So uh, for more details, there is always an article which is available and we encourage everyone to actually go and refer to that. So uh, speaking of so many statistical and residual tests so far, so this was a case study which was done recently. So uh, since we were fortunate enough to get a ground motion, strong ground motion data for especially the northern and northeastern part of India, so uh, we, we took the data from a couple of agencies like Rookie and uh, PESMOS as well as NCS. So the PESMOS uh, data is also from Rookie, but the thing is it covers more of the northern part. And whereas the one which is in the black uh, triangle, this is these are the recordings specific towards the Nepal earthquake which happened in 2015. So this is how our data distribution looks. So we have sufficient number of data within 100 kilometers and so on. Uh, so once we took the data, we did a set of uh, pre-processing needed to be done uh, so that we can get the output in the format that was desirable. So this is the typical data processing steps that are usually involved. We take a raw axial program, then that is baseline corrected and then Fourier transformation, and then we separate the signal from the noise. Then again, it's filtered and then a response spectrum is generated. So these are some of the common steps which we use. and. Uh, Again, uh, these uh, pre-processing steps are very specific to each recording, and it, this is not something that can be completely automated because especially since we were taking the data from multiple sources and the data format will be different from each of these recording agencies. Coming uh, to the test results, so the first one, what, what we uh, saw earlier was the qualitative test. Of, so here, uh, the black uh, circles or scatter plot, what you're seeing here, those are basically the observations that we had, and we try to see how different GMPs are actually capturing. So the GMPs that we tested were NGA GMPs mostly. So uh, because there were a lot of NGA GMPs which are being used in the seismic hazard study, so we wanted to give a more rational, uh, or we, we wanted to help in making a rational decision for all the hazard models. So uh, as you can see here, uh, especially at longer distance, uh, these GMPs tend to uh, underestimate the GM, uh, the ground motion intensity, whereas observation is quite higher. So what I'm trying to say is at far off distance, some of the GMPs may not be eligible as they are not able to capture the regional attenuation. So this was an interesting observation that we made. So the reason why each of these things are studied in detail is to make a well-informed judgment while deciding the weights for the logic tree. Uh, same thing when we consider log likelihood tests. Uh, uh, here, uh, so whenever we were talking about likelihood, higher the value, the greater the agreement between the model and the observation. So here, uh, some of the GMPs, they were performing really well, especially uh, CY08 or CB08, like that. So these are some of the models which we can actually use and they can also take a relatively uh, higher weight. That is what you can see here in the bottom plot. These are the weights which have been calculated by using the formula from Sherbum. So CY08 and CB08, they offered a higher weight as compared to the other GMPs. So in addition to this, EDR test was done and residual analysis tests were also done, but due to time constraint, I've limited those uh, slides as of now. So uh, 
the case study that I just showed, this was something that was done manually, wherein we we involved step by step and everything was corrected and everything was coded and it was uh, it was more of a study which was specific for that region and for that data set. Uh, however, open quake as in strong motion toolkit, which actually helps in doing all these tests at a more faster uh, rate as well as uh, at, and it's more efficient as compared to what we do it individually. So usually uh, some of the capabilities of uh, open quake or ground motion toolkit is that if you have a time astray, it can always generate a spectrum. It can estimate the ground motion intensity measures, and then um, it can do all these residual analysis and likelihood tests and EDR tests and single station analysis. And the toolkit comes with a lot of capabilities. And as I said earlier, the toolkit is an open source, uh, uh, open source, and also the manual is also publicly available. And the manual is very well explained uh, with examples as well. So we encourage all the users to make use of it. Uh, so like I was saying, th these are some of the plots that I will be showing now are some of the plots that have been generated from the manual or oh, sorry from the uh, toolkit. So first one is the total residuals like I explained and uh, apart from the standard deviation, it, which has an aleatory and an epistemic component. So we have what is, what is called as an inter event residual and intra event residual. So the same standard deviation is further split into inter and intra event. So the, these are also some of the things that we can actually study. And the, another one is residual trends with predictor variables like I explained and single station analysis. Oh, so this is particularly useful if you have a uh, sufficient number of records for a given station. So this is particularly becomes helpful in trying to understand the intra event residuals. And there is a likelihood test, log likelihood tests and so on. So upon speaking so much in detail about these tests, so finally, where does this all come up to is whenever we are trying to uh, form a logic tree. So as you know, this becomes an, an epistemic uncertainty. So that is the reason why we use multiple ground motion models and not just one. And, and usually the logic tree is subdivided based on the tectonic regime. And for each tectonic regime, we will be using the GMPs that are applicable. And depending upon how these GMPs actually perform in each of these uh, preliminary screening and quantitative and qualitative tests of the weights are usually decided. This is usually subjective and the, that is why we actually uh, uh, do a number of tests to make more calculated decisions. So this was a logic tree which was actually developed using the SMTK toolkit for the Eastern Caribbean as you can see here. So in summary of uh, selection, whenever we talk about the selection of GMMs for seismic hazard analysis, it needs to be more transparent and more uh, reproducible if at all, if somebody is uh, wants to use the same set of GMPs for their hazard study. So there should be a justifiable explanation for the choice of certain GMPs. And then most of the time, uh, we may not have access to the or uh, strong motion recordings, uh, which is the why, which is why you cannot do residual analysis. We cannot do log likelihood. Uh, I mean, like we can do log likelihood, but it's very limited application. So even if we have macro seismic observations, which we can most of the time we can get from the USGS website. So we can always go for qualitative methods. And overall, so they can make use of this uh, SMTK toolkit, so which comes readily and you can use them uh, uh, along with it. So Mainly, um, there is a library of ground motion models that have been implemented in the open quake. So the strong motion toolkit will mostly uh, work for the GMMs which are already there in the library. If at all, if uh, some of the GMMs are not available, we always encourage the users uh, to uh, get involved and they can also develop a model for the open quake and that will be used worldwide by everyone else. As of now, we have this Raghukanth and Iyengar from India. And obviously there is a lot of scope for other Indian GMPs which have been developed for the northern region to be implemented in the OQ. And as I said, the users are always encouraged in this aspect. Uh, in general, so now that we have discussed about seismic source modeling and ground motion modeling, so our next presentation will be uh, given by our team lead, uh, Marco. So we will be talking more about of combining both source modeling as well as ground motion modeling in the open quake engine and what are the different capabilities of the engine and I think you will give more information about that. So uh, 
we spoke so much about so many articles and so many uh, different manuals and so on so these are some of the resources which the audience can actually refer to to uh, know more in detail and in addition to that we have also given our uh, user guide and also there is some uh, open quick uh, users forum where you can always post questions and it's quite active and there will always be someone who will answer your questions many public users itself answer most of the questions in that as well apart from that we have psha training manual so uh, we encourage everybody to use our engine as well as the toolkit Thank you. So I'll be happy Kendra. to take. Uh, yeah, thank you, Dr. Kendra and Dr. Srasdi, uh, for a very detailed talk on probabilistic systemic analysis. Uh, now, may I request our session chairman, Professor Jair Kail, for his comments. Over to Professor Jair Kail. Thank you, Santanu. First, let me congratulate both the speakers, Dr. Kendra and Dr. Chandrasekhar. Again, it's a very detailed, systematic, you know, illustration of how to go ahead with the seismic hazard mapping. But I have again some lemon queries. That is, uh, you are emphasizing about the fault geometry. In certain cases, particularly in the intraplay regions, Earthquakes occur in the hidden pod in a, in a not known. Suppose Killary earthquake. It was absolutely decant trap cover. No surface fault is mapped. Earthquake has occurred. Suppose in Bhuj event, which is demarcated in world seismic hazard map or also in the Indian seismic zoning map, is a zone five or most hazardous area. Even in Bhuj area, where it is known, you know, high risk zone and seismic hazard zone. Even in that area, the 2001 earthquake did not occur on a known fault. The 1819 earthquake occurred on some other fault. And the 2001 Bhuj earthquake did not occur on the known faults like Kashmenan fault or other fault. It is on a hidden fault and that too, there are no surface rupture and no surface stress of fault on which fault has occurred. So these are the these are the bit, you know, uh, difficult situation for us to really take the fault geometry as a parameter for seismic hazard map. Even in the collision zone, you have got a better model or better uh, understanding of the in the Himalaya region, say, but that is also not not uniform. Western Himalaya, you have got shallow earthquakes and on the MHT, shallow, you know, uh, main Himalayan thrust zone where most of the earthquakes occur and they're all shallow. But when you come to Eastern Himalaya, the earthquakes are deeper, as deep as 50, 60 kilometer and they are not on the uh, shallow MHT, they are on the strike speed, you know, transverse fault. So these are my just curiosity or mm -hmm. uh, my, my query is how can we handle such situation where you have no idea about the hidden fault where or also where the model, the so-called thermotectonic model does not fit. Mm -hmm. This is uh, one query. The other query is how do you decluster? Because say, for example, you are saying after shocks. Now, what is the threshold? magnitude for that. Because the other day, uh, USGS scientist uh, said that the magnitude six would be the threshold magnitude for the, you know, seismicity globally. We were very uh, surprised. We thought that with the modernization of the seismic stations, maybe magnitude five is the threshold magnitude. But he said no, critically he said no. So again, threshold magnitude is very difficult to find out from the mm -hmm. from the uh, your MFD. And uh, say, for example, Nepal, there are two earthquakes, 7.8 and 7.3. Which one is after SOG and which one you want to discard? Mm -hmm. So these are the few critical, <laughs> critical you know, where is uh, from you, please, your comment, please. Okay, 
I'll start and then Shay asked me if you want to um, jump in, you can as well. Um, so uh, yeah, you're pointing out some of the really big challenges in PSAJ. Um, and starting with the, the first one about how we continue to be surprised. Um, the earthquakes that happen are not always included in uh, in our hazard models. And in some cases, uh, we're really just truly limited because we're not aware of the structures that exist. And there, there are possible um, solutions to that, such as collecting more and more deep seismic data, um, uh, borehole strains, uh, finding out like little details about areas. Um, but those are data that can't be collected quickly. Um, and, it, and it's a very big challenge and something very limiting. Um, in terms of when there are faults that are close to other known structures, uh, so for example, um, you indicated some instances where the earthquake is near a main fault, but not occurring on that main fault. Uh, one way of addressing this is to balance the uh, fault source model with a distributed seismicity model. So for example, you may include one model uh, that has faults and some distributed seismicity, some smooth seismicity, which is mostly low rates if, um, if you don't have any earthquakes occurring. But then there's another whole branch of the logic tree where you're drawing a polygon that includes the fault and um, and saying, OK, we're not actually certain the earthquake will happen on the fault. It could happen somewhere nearby, somewhere within tens or maybe 100 kilometers. And so you're giving the model a chance to produce a large earthquake that's not exactly on that known fault. So that's one way of handling instances like that. Um, and uh, again, it's a uh, it's a big challenge that's discussed in in the whole field of PSAJ. So it's uh, it's not just a layman's question. <laughs> um, in terms of declustering, this is actually also something that's discussed a lot. Um, the the classical um, algorithms that are used, if two magnitude seven earthquakes occur close to each other, then um, then uh, depending on the way the code is set up. If um, if they're exactly the same magnitude, then most likely the first one will be taken. Um, if they're slightly different magnitudes, then the larger one will be taken. And so that's the way the algorithms work. Uh, but there's plenty of ongoing research um, looking into different things, uh, different ways of deciding which events should be removed. Um, and uh, these might uh, include, for example, not only looking at the hypocenter, but actually looking at the fault plane. Um, there are also ongoing uh, discussions on whether it's appropriate to remove um, so many uh, of the large events. Um, so so these are um, these are big questions that are uh, constantly being discussed. And Shreyasi, would you like to Thank add you. anything? Thank you so much. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I would just like to add that even aftershock PSHA is such a highly researched topic these days. Uh, so like I said, this is not something that we can. It's not like a standard recipe. It varies from study from one region to another region. So yeah, there will be a lot of parameters that needs to be considered before we take any sort of decision about any of these steps that comes in modeling stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, Shashi. Uh, uh, I think we can take some questions, right, Kendra, from attendees. Yeah. So over to uh, Mr. Prasis Joe. So we'll take on this from attendees. Over yes, to yes, yeah. sir. We'll take on this yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you, uh, both of you, for such an informative talk. Uh, I'm going to read out the questions from the participant end. The fourth, que the first question will be. Uh, what kind of regression technique is employed for magnitude conversion process during homogenization? At the same time, without using the known declustering technique, why don't you cooperate uh, stochastic based ETS model for declustering the tech, uh, catalog? Um, OK, to answer the, the first question, um, the magnitude uh, conversions are often using um, uh, least least squares regressions, um, but 
but the toolkit uh, implemented by GEM has uh, flexibility in it so that you can modify the uh, shape of the of the curve that's used to convert. So for example, maybe you want to use a piecewise function instead of uh, just a linear regression. Um, and in terms of the, the declustering uh, techniques, um, you're um, uh, covering the same point as uh, uh, as was just uh, discussed a little bit. So uh, these are these are definitely solutions that are being looked into, but they're currently not the state of practice um, to use a new test model, for example. Uh, thank you, ma'am. The next question will be uh, how to select the lowest and highest unstable frequency during filtering of oscillograms. OK. Um so whenever uh, uh, we talk about uh, i mean in our case what we did was a bandpass filter so i found the lowest corner frequency based on signal to noise uh, ratio so when, when when i calculated and i used that as a uh, i used 3 uh, snr value was taken as 3 and so from starting from the higher frequency side Oh, I chose a threshold value where uh, the signal was dipping below three. Oh, so again, uh, in our case, we used uh, a lower uh, frequency of 0.3, but there are also been incidents or waveforms which had a higher, uh, lower cut frequency, low cut frequency. Sorry. Thank you, ma'am. The next question is any comment for the area which do not have strong motion observation to generate GMP? I mean, uh, there are there is uh, stochastic GMBs which are being developed. At least in India, we are using it because, uh, especially in the southern part, we do not have much of the strong motion recording. And also, the networks that have come up now, uh, they are more or less, uh, you know, fairly recent. So we, when we do not have sufficient waveform data to go ahead with. An empirical GMP, we always use a stochastic GMP. So, wherein based on limited recordings that we have, we try to derive the source parameter and also the path characteristics and so on, and then it's being built up. So, there are stochastic GMPs which are possible whenever we do not have sufficient earthquake record. Another uh, another opportunity is to uh, use analog regions around the globe. So, for example, to try and find somewhere where based on um, other types of data you can consider the regions to be comparable. Um, so for example, in uh, subduction zones or in stable crust, uh, things like this, especially if they're um, they're produced using global data sets as opposed to, to local or regional data sets. So that, that helps a little bit, but it also supports the argument for using logic trees um, because we're not able to definitively prove that any GMPE is uh, behaving well um, yeah. without without that strong motion recording. True, and because because we believe that a single GMP may not be able to capture everything that is going on in a particular region, that is why we always promote using multiple models. Uh, thank you, ma'am. There are a lot of questions in the Q&A section as well as in our minds also, but due to this kind of time constraint, we are not going to, we are able to do the uh, further questions. We are going to uh, email the questions uh, and if you don't mind, please answer them. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Over to Dr. Santun, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, now, I request uh, Dr. Novosity Molia for both of you. Dr. Novosity Molia. Thank you, sir. Namaskar. A wonderful evening from Assam, India. I do my best would like to utilize this occasion on behalf of entire CSRNS family to thank Dr. Kendra Johnson and Dr. C.S.C. Sondrasekhar from Global Earthquake Model Foundation, Italy, for their hearty acceptance to be part of IBWCST 2021 family. Dr. Johnson's lecture study entitled Introduction to Probabilistic Seismic Hazard Analysis was highly insightful. And today's session further elucidated on building up probabilistic seismic hazard analysis input model. Thanks to both of you, ma'am. Besides, I also convey my sincere regards to Director Dr. Z. Norhari Sasti of CSI and his Zoha for his surplus effort and keenness to make this event unsealed. Thank you once again, sir.
I feel fortunate profoundly to extend my gratitude to the international advisor of this workshop, Dr. Andy J. Michael and session advisor, Professor Da Ping Zhao for their enormous support for this event. A huge applause from entire CSIR needs to session chairperson, Professor Zaya Kai, former D Deputy Director General of GSIR, Gopt of India and co chairperson Dr. Sir Burwasar, Chief Scientist CSIR News for steering the course of this workshop. It's my pleasure to thank Dr. Santanu Borua, convener IBWGST 2021, for his amiable commitment for this program. We, once again, from the core of our hearts, thank you for your acumen and hard work to unite the geoscientific fraternity from around the world in a single platform via IBWGST 2021. I bestow my earnest thanks to everyone involved in this session of IBWGST 2021. Nevertheless, See you all for tomorrow's session lecture by Dr. Sebastiano Di Amico from University of Malta on seismotechnics of the Central Mediterranean area sharply at 10 a.m. Indian Standard Time. Once again, I thank you all for being with us today. With love, see you all. Thank, thank you. you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Kendall. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.